All right, so let's, I guess, pick up um, with why do we care about COVID? Well, first of all, it's killed over a million people in the United States alone, and it has disabled many more. But here's another reason. So this is from Fortune Well. The headline is, COVID can cause new health problems to appear years after infection, according to a study of more than 130,000 patients. So this is from last month. And um, it basically references another study. So it says, even as national institutions struggle to coordinate meaningful trials for possible long COVID treatments, and I'll add something that has really gone completely by the wayside. There have been all these sort of, um, you know, institutes for studying long COVID set up, and um, none of them have really amounted to much at this point. It's just not really a priority. But um, researchers continue to tally the damage. New findings suggest that the disease's reach isn't merely long, it's still growing. Yeah, so it's a novel virus that can significantly impair immune function. Of course, it is going to have far-reaching consequences. We already knew that in the first year or two. And when you mess with your immune system like that, as well as basically globally, most major systems in the body, uh, the SARS coronavirus 2 virus itself can infect basically any tissue type that has ACE2 receptors in the cells. And so that's your brain. It can infect the brain stem, which is like the control box for your autonomic functions, like breathing and keeping your heart beating. You know, that automatic stuff you don't have to think about. So you can get dysautonomia or like irregular heartbeat and other things because your brain stem is messed up from a COVID infection. Um, your heart, your liver, your pancreas, your gut, kidneys, male reproductive organs, all kinds of tissue types. So uh, really significant organ damage. And then also it can infect T cells, which are a major uh, component of your immune system. So, um, you know, having depleted T cells is not a good thing. It leaves you more prone both to getting other infections and to things like cancer. So not good at all. Um, so yeah, it's novel. We don't understand what its long-term effects are yet, but we know that it can cause global infection more or less in the body, causing, you know, there's like a hundred different symptoms of long COVID. And that's not because it's psychosomatic or people are just imagining the stuff. It's because it can cause all this damage in the body that then manifests differently in different people because everybody, you know, has the same basic organs, but people's constitution for lack of a better word you know people's um exact state of health is going to be different from person to person and so it just shows up it presents differently in different people causes more damage uh, to some organs in some people and more damage to other organs in other people so anyway yeah uh so three years after their initial bouts with covid19 patients who'd once been hospitalized with the virus remained at quote significantly elevated risk of death or worsening health from long COVID complications, according to a paper published May 30 in Nature Medicine. So let's take a quick look at that paper. We're just going to read the abstract. So this is from Nature Medicine. The title is Three Year Outcomes of Post-Acute Sequelae of COVID-19. Sequelae, it's like the word sequel. It's something that comes after. So it means consequences when in the health context, the sequelae of a disease are the consequences of a disease. So you get COVID-19, what happens? And when they say post-acute sequelae, in other words, you get the infection and then for like three weeks, you get the acute phase. That's when you get the fever, the coughing, like all that kind of stuff up front. But then there's the post-acute phase after those three weeks. In the following months and years, you can have consequences, sequelae. So that's what this is about. And specifically, they're talking about three years out what's going on as a consequence of this infection. So the abstract, severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2, or SARS coronavirus 2, infection causes post-acute sequelae of coronavirus disease 2019, also known as COVID-19, or PASC, as we were just saying, in many organ systems. Risks of these sequelae have been characterized up to two years after infection, but longer term follow-up is limited. Here, we built a cohort that's just like a data set of 135,161 people with SARS coronavirus 2 infection and 5,200,000 controls from the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs who were followed for three years 
in order to estimate the risks of death and long COVID. Among the non-hospitalized individuals, because um, if you're hospitalized during the acute phase, you have much higher odds of getting long COVID. You actually have majority greater than 50% odds of getting long COVID. If you're not hospitalized during the acute phase, meaning that your infection is not bad enough as to require hospitalization, hospital care, then uh, you're less likely to get COVID, although the odds are still substantial of getting some long COVID symptoms. But anyway, among non-hospitalized individuals, the increased risk of death was no longer present after the first year of infection. Okay, so if you make it that first year, you're kind of good and apparently it wears off, generally speaking. And risk of incident PASC declined over the three years, but still contributed 9.6 disability adjusted life years per 1,000 persons in the third year. Among hospitalized individuals, risk of death declined, but remained significantly elevated in the third year after infection. Wow. So if you're hospitalized with COVID, you have an elevated risk of death in the following three years, which will decline from year to year, but it stays elevated over baseline. The risk of incident PASC declined over the three years, but subsequent residual risk remained in the third year, leading to 90 disability adjusted life years per 1000 persons. Altogether, our findings show reduction of risks over time, but the burden of mortality and health loss remains in the third year among hospitalized individuals. So if you're not hospitalized, there are risks in that first year. Things are likely to, at least as far as your risk of death, wear off after that first year. But if you're hospitalized and the older you are, or if you have other you know, lung conditions and things, more likely you are to be hospitalized, well then you're at risk of death, elevated risk of death for three years after that point. And the way that this whole thing is working with uh, just letting it rip and letting the virus just reinfect people over and over and over again. Well, um, you know, people, you could be hospitalized multiple times. So people have got to stop catching this thing. You just have to. Um, We're going to actually talk about how to do that by wearing masks in just a minute. There was a study on the efficacy of masks. And guess what? N95s work. Um, and surprisingly, KN95s were pretty ineffective. Those are the ones with the ear loops. Uh, personally, I've, I think, always said that N95s are the best. That's what I wear. KN95s are at least something, but according to this, they weren't much better than cloth masks. Anyway, we'll get to that in a second. First, though, let's look at a study out of SIDRAP at the University of Minnesota. I think that that's the Center for Infectious Disease Reporting and Policy, I think. Anyway, uh, so this is from May 29, and it says, Those severe COVID-19 infections in children are uncommon. Children and young adults with comorbidities, that is, other illnesses, are at increased risk for critical illness during COVID-19 infections, according to a new study in the Journal of the Pediatric Infectious Diseases Society. Quote, We selected studies that included patients aged 21 years or fewer, with confirmed COVID-19 and provided enough data to estimate the odds ratio or OR of critical disease for a given risk factor, the authors said. So the odds ratio is basically just, do you have elevated risk or reduced risk compared to the baseline? The studies collectively examined 172,165 children, adolescents, and young adults with COVID-19 in 45 countries. So we're talking about um, people up to the age of 21. So this isn't just young children. Heart disease adds to the risk. In healthy children with no comorbidities, like no known other diseases, the absolute risk of critical disease from COVID-19 was 4%, so 1 in 25. Compared with no comorbidities, the pooled odds ratio for critical disease was 3.95 for the presence of one comorbidity and 9.51 for two or more comorbidities. The highest critical risk factor was age under one month. So youngest newborns are the most at risk. With seven studies on about 1,300 infants aged under one month, showing that 20% had critical illness. But the authors warned that that number includes premature infants, and it may or may not be widely representative of the true risk 
to full-term babies. Okay, that's still significant. 51 studies assessed the risk of cardiac and pulmonary, that is heart and lung comorbidities, including congenital heart disease, high blood pressure, heart failure, cardiomyopathies, valvular disease, septal defects, arrhythmias, and pulmonary hypertension. So a variety of the more common heart and lung issues. The rate of critical disease among 2,372 children with cardiovascular disease in these studies was 30%, and the pooled odds ratio was 3.6, the authors said. Previous pulmonary conditions, so like you don't have it now, but you had it in the past, were a risk factor for severity with a pooled critical disease rate of 24% and an odds ratio of 2.15 or double. Seizure disorders pose a substantial risk. Quote, few studies examined the extent to which poorly controlled asthma modifies the severity of COVID-19 in children, the author said. Children with controlled asthma showed no significant risk for severe disease, but uncontrolled asthma, so people who are not getting proper medical care or you can't afford or aren't taking the inhaler for some reason or whatever other medication, that more than doubled the risk of developing severe COVID-19. So the adjusted risk ratio was 2.24. One study found that children, however, who were hospitalized for asthma within 12 months of the study were at increased risk for acute COVID-19 severity. So that's almost triple. Children with seizure disorders and other neurologic complications, because remember, there's a lot of brain and nervous system oriented problems that uh, happen with the long COVID. So that is significant. So children with seizure disorders and other neurological complications had more than triple the odds of critical illness compared to the general pediatric population. Odds ratio 3.40, so almost three and a half times as much. In addition, obesity, diabetes, and compromised immune systems were also tied to statistically significant odds ratios greater than two or more than double. Quote, the current management of COVID-19 in the pediatric population is multifaceted, requiring a balanced assessment of the potential risks and benefits of various therapeutic agents, as well as a comprehensive evaluation of the myriad underlying risk factors that may predispose children to more severe disease, the authors concluded. Although our study is subject to certain limitations, it contributes evidence on several risk factors that are clearly associated with a more severe disease trajectory. So um, it's bad for kids. We already know from previous studies that getting a COVID infection increases kids' risk of getting both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. So, I mean, those have totally different etiologies, and that's not good because it does um, attack the pancreas and damage the pancreas. And so there's enough uh, type 2 diabetes in particular from uh, you know dietary and lifestyle issues. But then... <clears throat> to be upping your odds because of viral infection is just really the last thing that anybody needs at this point. Um, but let's talk about avoiding COVID. So let's go over to the N95 mask study. And I found this interesting. So this is uh, out of the University of Maryland. N95 masks block almost all airborne COVID-19. Well, that's not surprising because that's you know, pretty much what they're made for. I mean, not COVID specifically, but exactly this kind of thing. Unlike a surgical mask, which are really not meant um, for airborne, I mean, uh, aerosol particles, uh, but more for droplets. And remember that COVID-19 or SARS coronavirus 2, the virus that causes COVID-19, is transmitted in an aerosol fashion. In other words, it hangs in the air like smoke or like... Um, you know, use an aerosol air freshener and it hangs in the air and you can smell it for hours after. Yeah, that's because it's very tiny particles that are light enough to hang in the air, more or less. And so the virus acts the same way. And the more that people are singing or shouting or just breathing forcefully, whatever, um, expelling air forcefully, the more it's going to be hanging in the air. But anyway, in a head to head comparison of masks worn by people with active COVID-19, the inexpensive duckbill N95 came out on top, stopping 98% of COVID-19 particles in the breath of infected people from escaping into the air. So that's on the outgoing side. In other words, um, if you have COVID, wearing the mask will stop it from going into the air, or it will stop 98% of it from getting into the air. 
Now, it's true that just one viral particle can be enough to cause infection, but the less you're putting into the air, the lower the odds that, you know, it's going to end up in um, somebody else's respiratory tract. So anyway, led by researchers from the University of Maryland School of Public Health, results showed other masks also performed well, blocking at least 70 percent of viral particles from escaping from the source and infected persons exhaled breath. The study, which is titled Relative Efficacy of Masks and Respirators as Source Control for Viral Aerosol Shedding, so source control means it's controlling it at the source, an infected person's mouth uh, and nose, for viral aerosol shedding from people infected with SARS coronavirus 2, published May 29 in eBiomedicine, a Lancet journal. Quote, uh, the research shows that any mask is much better than no mask and an N95 is significantly better than the other options. That's the number one message, says the study's senior author, Dr. Donald Milton. Milton is a UMD School of Public Health professor of environmental health and a global expert on how viruses spread through the air. Quote, because COVID-19 is airborne, we focused on the extent to which wearing a mask reduces contamination of the air around you, Milton says. This latest study is a continuation of investigations by UMD's Public Health Aerobiology Lab into how contagious respiratory viruses such as influenza contaminate the air. How do they do it? Researchers asked volunteers with COVID-19 to breathe into a unique contraption known as the Gesundheit 2 machine. Funny. Developed by Milton and colleagues to measure viruses in exhaled breath. Participants who breathed into the machine for 30 minutes at a time were asked to do a variety of vocalizations, for example, repeating the alphabet, singing happy birthday, and even honoring UMD's mascot by repeatedly shouting, go Terps. In each instance, researchers measured the amount of viral particles in the exhaled breath of volunteers, pairing each 30-minute session of breathing with a mask on with another 30-minute session with no mask. Quote, data from our study suggests that a mildly symptomatic person with COVID-19 who is not wearing a mask exhales a little over two infectious doses per hour, says first author Dr. Jian Yu Lai, a postdoctoral researcher at the PHAB lab. But when wearing an N95 mask, the risk goes down exponentially. The duckbill N95 blocked 99% of large particles and 98% of small particles from escaping out of a person's mask. Milton says that the design's tight seal, a powerful filter in the mask, and large airspace for breath to move around all contribute to the duckbill's success. So that's really interesting to me because for a while I was using duckbills, not because I read that they were the most effective, but because they were the cheapest. And actually they look kind of weird, but um, I found that there was this one particular brand which is not made anymore, which is the only reason I stopped using them, um, that it was super cheap for a box of 50. It was like $20 for a box of 50. And uh, I just got a really nice fit from this particular model. Um, and I switched to Auras, which I think also make a nice seal and they're comfortable. Um, but what they're saying about having a large airspace for breath to move around, that means inside the mask, between your face and the mask, there is a large airspace. I think it's bigger in the duckbill than it is in the uh, auras, the 3M auras. Um, so anyway, good to know. I actually still have a box of duckbills, so I might uh, use those in more critical situations, like maybe in the, the winter. Surprisingly, KN95 masks, the disposable masks used widely, were no more effective than cloth or surgical masks. So I've always shied away from the KN95s, and I've mentioned this because the ear loops, rather than the head straps, which the N95s have, they just don't make a good seal at all. I would sometimes use them more in like outdoor conditions where, and not outdoors in a crowd, but like outdoors where there's not a lot of people around. Uh, but I didn't really rely on the KN95s too much, like indoors or anything like that. And it was really for this reason. Um, I didn't do a full study, but they confirmed what I suspected. The study found that a common brand of KN95 masks leak more air than duckbills or other studied masks because they don't conform to the face well. That flaw is compounded by a powerful filter with more flow resistance that pushes air out of the mask at the sides 
instead of through the filter, allowing more virus particles to escape into the surrounding air. So in other words, the N95s, um, it's less likely to push the mask out from your face. I would noticeably um, have that occurring with the KN95s where I'd be wearing it. And if I had to, well, like I just did, you know, like cough or clear my throat or something like that, um, I would notice the mask like puffing away from my face because the air wasn't able to get through the mask. And so it was pushing the mask away like a sail. And so anyway, this uh, pretty much confirms that. So I'll stay away from those from now on. Cloth masks also outperformed both KN95 and surgical masks. That's amazing. Cloth masks outperform the KN95. Milton theorizes that cloth masks with greater coverage wrap around the face and give a better seal than either KN95 or surgical masks. With cloth mask filters, flow resistance is also lower, meaning it lets more air through, allowing breath to pass through the filter and not leak out the sides of the mask. So this is really just like stick with the N95s. Limiting the amount of viral or P100s. So it didn't study P100s, it sounds like, but those are very secure on the face and they let a lot of air through. Limiting the amount of viral particles in the air is a key way, I would say the key way, to control highly contagious respiratory viruses in general, Milton said. This is even more the case with the COVID-19 virus, given that transmissibility has increased over time because the virus has mutated to be more transmissible, with Omicron in particular breaking through the immunity that people had developed from vaccinations or prior infections. Quote, our research shows definitively why it's so important to have non-pharmaceutical responses like wearing masks and why we need studies like this to illuminate which masks are most effective, says Milton. Both Milton and Lai hope that their findings will inform health policies going forward, including when combating potential outbreaks like bird flu or even the common flu. So um, there's actually a little more. Uh, let's just finish that. Duckbill N95 masks should be the standard of care in high-risk situations, such as nursing homes and healthcare settings, Lai says. Now, when the next outbreak of a severe respiratory virus occurs, we know exactly how to help control the spread with this simple and inexpensive solution. And then they go on with some more credits. But there you go. Um, I'll get into the chat in a minute. But speaking of bird flu, let's talk about this for a minute. So this is an article in The Nation. There's a lot of different articles about this. I just want to use this as a jumping off point. I know some of you in the chat already know things about the bird flu. And so feel free to type those and we'll discuss them. But let's just give everybody a jumping off point. So the title is We're Facing a Potential Bird Flu Catastrophe. H5N1 is spreading across the U.S., targeting some of our most vulnerable communities and exposing our tattered public health system. Yeah, it's not really tattered so much as even what is there Nobody has any political will to stand up for what's needed. That was like when Biden announced vaccine relax in May 2021, when that made absolutely no sense and basically killed the collective pandemic response. Nobody stood up to it. I mean, really, like on an institutional, organizational, you know, maybe even statewide level, nobody stood up to it. I mean, it was just kind of silence. There were a few holdouts that kept doing uh, mask requirements for like another week or a month, but that was that was really it. So anyway, we need bold action and we need it now. We sure do. And um, it's not just here. It's with housing. It's with Medicare for all. It's with all kinds of, you know, there's just an across the board cost of living crisis. Whether it was wealthy Londoners fleeing to the countryside to avoid the bubonic plague in the early 17th century, or Manhattanites heading for upstate and seaside retreats to do the same to avoid SARS coronavirus 2 in the early 21st, urban elites have rarely stuck around for pandemics. As Troy Tassier says in his new book, The Rich Flee and the Poor Take the Bus, quote, the most physical and financial harm from epidemics falls upon the people who are least privileged and most marginalized, while those with the most resources seek out the best security and safety money can buy. And let me tell you, only rich people need this explained to them. Yet the notion of rural communities as refuges from disease then and now doesn't match up with reality. Those rich Londoners brought the plague with them to the small villages and hamlets nearby. And far from there being a safe haven, the mortality rate from COVID-19 was 20% higher in rural America than in urban enclaves. 
This misconception is grounded in a refusal to recognize that rather than an unspoiled oasis, our rural counties are home to some of our most marginalized populations, from the meat and poultry workers that keep us fed to the upstate prisons where cities lock up those they would rather ignore and forget. The virus raced through those areas, amplifying the pandemic across the landscape with deadly consequences. Everything that made rural America uniquely vulnerable to COVID-19 still exists. And now a new threat from a well-known pathogen, influenza, is brewing in America's rural heartland. An outbreak of H5N1 started months ago and is spreading across dairy farms in the United States. This strain of bird flu looks like it is, quote, well entrenched and has been in cattle for a long time and probably very, very, very widespread, as Stat News reported. While there are only two documented human cases thus far, given the poor surveillance effort to date, there are likely other people infected as well. And I saw something about, um, I wasn't able to grab it for the show here, but I saw something about wastewater surveillance in Texas at times being as high as the like regular flu. I don't know if anybody knows anything about that, let me know. I read that and couldn't believe it, but... While this strain of H5N1 has not yet acquired the ability to spread through the air or person to person, the virus presents potentially serious health risks to those who work with cattle on dairy operations in rural areas. The vast majority of those working on the front lines are immigrants, many of them undocumented. Anthropologist Thurka Sangamorti has talked about the precarity of the lives of these workers from not having, quote, rights within the workspace, not having access to good housing, or being really scared to speak up when they're being exploited or when they feel like they're being discriminated against. Agricultural workers also face an increasingly threadbare rural health system, which is ill-equipped to respond to their needs. Over the past 30 years, rural America has lost hospitals, primary care providers, and public health infrastructure. Many farm workers lack insurance and have tenuous connections to health care and other services. Without robust health systems and formal safety nets, many farm workers and their families turn to Band-Aid care, as in putting Band-Aids on things that need stitches, rather than care that would help them over the long term, or in other words, appropriate levels of care. Now add a new pathogen into the mix. We know the U.S. public health system is weak, social protections are inadequate, and health care is tilted toward expensive, tertiary, specialized practices. Rural America is ground zero for this structural, human-made disaster, which makes rural farming communities desperately vulnerable to H5N1. For all the bluster of the current response to H5N1, with the CDC, the FDA, and the USDA all out with their plans to address the virus and its spread, no one is acknowledging that a crisis already existed in these places. Dealing with this new outbreak will undoubtedly expose the long-standing political failures to address the public health needs of these communities. Band-Aid care is no match for H5N1 if it acquires the mutations it needs to transmit efficiently among humans. And if the outbreak takes off in these settings, there is simply no firewall to stop it from making the trip from its rural origins into the rest of the country. The instinct of those in Atlanta, which is the CDC headquarters, or DC, is to deal with the current emergency and ignore the rest. Except that is not how the world works. We tried it with COVID in the US and the fundamental weaknesses in American public health, welfare, and healthcare ensured that we did worse than our G7 peers in COVID deaths and excess deaths per capita, let alone you know, the non-imperialist countries. H5N1 is not yet a human epidemic, but the widespread nature of its grip on livestock and rural communities means it gets to bide its time. In other words, um, the virus is sitting there with the Rubik's Cube and every additional hour or day that you give it to flip through that thing, you know, it's <laughs> it's um, you're rolling the dice. I mean, we talked about that a lot with COVID, but you're rolling the dice because every time that the thing replicates, there's a chance of mutation and there's always a chance that the mutation is going to be more efficient than its previous form. It, it isn't always more efficient, but there's a chance that it will be. As with COVID-19, we are offering false assurances with the ubiquitous refrain of, we have the tools, suggesting that a technical fix, the mere existence of vaccines, tests, and treatments for influenza will be our salvation. Yet we know that this is a vastly insufficient response. We still have the time to address structural issues plaguing rural America, to give those 
living in rural agricultural counties and the rest of us a leg up on H5N1, though it's admittedly a race against the clock and would require a massive investment of resources and political will. There are signs that President Biden and Congress want to invest in rural America to lift up economic opportunity. I mean, as always with the Democrats, this is like tinkering around the edges, but if you say so. But investing in rural health is vital to these economic strategies. They must go hand in hand. Wait, you mean that people doing the work also need medical care to stay in good enough health to do the work? I don't get it. There are encouraging moves here as well. Are there like Joe Biden, who is, quote, for a public option that was on his campaign website? Literally, it has never come up once since then and actively opposes Medicare for all encouraging moves, really. But we need something akin to a Marshall Plan for rural America. I mean, yeah, except we're in neoliberalism, which is basically underpinned by profitability crises for late stage capitalism. Um, ever since the 60s and 70s, they've been like, what are we going to do about this? The capitalist class collectively, they came up with neoliberalism, basically privatize, deregulate and defund public programs. And um, that's what they're doubling down on all the time now. So, I mean, you know, they're, they're not really interested in, in making those kinds of investments. And we're really reaching a point where the tiniest changes would more or less require a revolution. They just don't want to do anything. And there might be bipartisan support for such bold efforts, particularly in health. Are you fucking kidding me? Like, there's a link there to something, but, you know, uh, bipartisan support. If so, I mean, it's token, you know, that's that's not widespread. Finally, the revival and survival of rural, I mean, at least among the politicians, obviously, like a lot of people want a better, better health care system. Only 8% of Democratic voters oppose Medicare for all. Only 8% oppose it. That's one in 12. Yet the party, the politicians, they don't do anything about it. Like literally only Bernie Sanders and, you know, and Bernie was a sheepdog and Bernie was a fake and he continues to be a fake. But he at least kept talking about Medicare for all, even when, you know, nobody was forcing him to. Literally no other politician in the Democratic Party was talking about that at all. So, no, I, I don't think that that support is super deep, uh, you know, within the one percent controlled Democratic Party, which is to say the whole party. Um, you know, obviously you have people in the party who support it. <laughs> Only 8% oppose it. But um, yet nothing happens. Why is that? Is it because the party it doesn't actually represent most of the people who vote for them? Yes, that is why. Finally, the revival and survival of rural America depends on immigrants. Over 70% of farm workers are foreign born. And so the economic and health initiatives we surely need will be for naught unless we safeguard the future of these workers and their families from xenophobic policies, from county seats, state houses, and from D.C. Wait, are you saying that particularly the ultra-reactionary, petty, you know, lower strata of uh, capitalists in various localities can't think beyond extremely short-term profits? I mean, that's how the whole system works. But then you get the people who are particularly um myopic and you know sort of like never traveled outside of their you know <laughs> hometown kind of thing but anyway managed to get their hands on power h5n1 reminds us that when it comes to infectious diseases there is no place to hide no refuge or safety except what we build together systems and infrastructures to protect all of us perhaps this time around we'll do better and chalk up a victory against an old foe they got to end with this like sort of false hope uh, conclusion there why i don't know because they don't want to like you know bum people out man but um hey the reality is not that great